Okay. My queries are running slow. What's your answer? Okay, so, so this is something, my slide, so to speak, my, my divisions. Um, aspects of efficiency. How do we make an efficient system? I mean, we can ask what the question, what is efficient? Well, efficiency, this is kind of the things that I've identified as contributing to efficiency of any computer system. And if you can think of any others, we can add them to the list. So obviously there's the hardware and software that you're running things on. If you've got a, a small processor, a small server, you're going to run slowly. Uh, the more RAM you've got, et cetera, the more disk space you've got, it, the better it's going to run. Also, some software is, runs faster than other software. Larger programs tend to be much slower than smaller programs. So you get lean, lean and mean and big and all singing and all dancing. There's the schema design. We've gone over these kinds of things. Have you chosen the correct data type? So using a data type that stores, for example, if you're doing an integer and your integers are only uh, go up to 255, 0 to 255, how are you using a 4-bit? Are you storing that as uh, using a 1-byte data type? Or are you storing it with an integer data type that perhaps stores, requires 8 or 16 bytes. The more space on disk that's taken up, the slower the system is going to be. Then, we, last week, we looked at, uh, we saw a bit about data mining and the denormalization of, uh, of uh, a data schema in the data mining, for data mining to increase the efficiency of software of, of query retrieval in the uh, data mining situation as opposed to being in the uh, or data warehouse situation as opposed to being in a transaction type of uh, environment so we've covered those and the rest of the the lecture are basically going to cover two the section three and four database tuning touching on indexes and query optimization and also routine maintenance of your database. And then finally, a little bit on distributed databases, uh, which is not, again, not my area of expertise. So the system architecture can affect how quickly the system runs. The fifth one, of course, is the interface design. It, does the interface work well? Is it efficient from the user perspective, uh, finding things? to be able to do the analysis that they, they need to do? Can they find the right tools to do it? But also how quickly the interface itself runs, takes time to run, how quickly is it slow to perform? And then it's got to kick, talk to the database itself to get the data out the database, so there may be network problems, for example, as well. That probably should be under system architecture. There may be network problems as well. So. We're going to deal with three and four today, five next year. Indexes. Well, we've touched on indexes, but I thought I'd mention them again, especially given that I hadn't given you an example of a spatial index yet, although there, were, there is one in the notes. So as we know, if we, didn't, if we just had tables without indexes, we'd have to search often search all the way through, or at least through a lot of the records in a table to get the answer. And that means it can be quite slow, especially as the databases get larger. And the purpose of indexes is to speed up data retrieval from the tables. Uh, I don't know, let's see, let's see if I can understand that. Okay, so, We'll leave that one and we'll just get down to there. So here's an example of what's called a B tree index. I think you might have seen this before. Um, so you've got a whole load of records, records of names, and you want to be able to quick search them quite quickly. A B tree index is a tree structure, a hierarchical tree structure, which allows us to quickly locate particular rows. So at the top level, we have three nodes in our tree. 
all names that start with letters between AA and DI. Then we've got a section. We've got, so this box here, or this one here, is all all names between A and DI. This box here is all names between DI and LU. This one between LU and RH. And this one between RH and the end of the alphabet, ZZ. So we go to the first node and we say, OK, uh, let's search for me, KID, K-I-D-D. Well, we're between, we're higher than the DI, KL, lower than the LU, so we go down to this node here. And then we do the same thing, splitting up within the, the very, to, into other sections, and we've got between DI and F, between F and H, H and KR, and KR and LU, OK, K, so I'm KI, so I'm between KAR and LU, which takes me down to... Yeah. Obviously, not all links are shown on that diagram. But the basic principle is, instead of having to go all the way through all our records to find me, all we have to do is go from that node to this node to this node, and then sort through these, and then search through these. So we're talking one, two, three steps to get to at least a block of data that contain me versus searching all the way through all the records until we happen to find me. Now, I may be the first record in the database, but I may be the last record in the database. And if we've got several million records to go through to get to me, we might have to search through several million records, whereas here, we're probably reducing that to maybe four, five, six steps. So instead of a million steps, we've got one step. And we can do this for spatial. In the, we can do this for spatial uh, data as well. So this is an example of what's called an R tree, and an example of the types of indexes that can be implemented on spatial data. So this is works very similarly to a B tree, but instead of it being the letters, I'll make, us making a decision on the basis of letters. Uh, the, the initial letters in our names. We're making the decisions about on a basis of a hierarchical set of bounding boxes in our data set. So, we've got individual objects which have bounding boxes and that is defines where an individual entity is. So that's a polygon or a line or something like that. And then what the R tree algorithm does is it builds a set of nested hierarchical boxes around those boxes, those initial entity boxes. Okay, so here we've got each individual polygon. So let's do this one here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight entities, polygons, lines, whatever they are. And around that, at the next hierarchical level, we've got a bounding box that encloses a set of entity bounding boxes. And these higher level bounding boxes are optimized so that they minimize the geographical area each box covers. They minimize any overlap between the boxes, the hierarchical bounding boxes at the hierarchical level. They maximize the margins. And I'd have to look out what exactly maximizing the margins is. Uh, I'd have to check that. And also maximize inner node utilization. We won't worry really about those two. But basically, the idea is you have a very compact hierarchy of nesting that optimizes the access to the spatial data underneath. And that's very similar. So, so we want to do a query. We put, out, we put our query box across our area. Our query initially looks at the high-level boxes and says, which high-level boxes do I, does my query area intersect? It identifies those high-level objects. 
and then it, you can work down the hierarchy to the lower levels of the hierarchy to access the actual entities that exist within those bounding boxes. Is that reasonably clear? Can't say I'm an expert on, on these, these algorithms. We use them every day, but I don't need, really need to, on a daily basis, don't need to understand them. But the principle is there. You have this set of hierarchical boxes that allows you, once you've selected your area, identify which of these highest level hierarchical boxes are intersected, then you burrow down to get the, uh, the, int the information or enclosed within your query. So what do, we, what, what do you index? You've got a database. Well, how do you know what to index? Well, you can obviously, primary keys are usually automatically indexed. That's normally a part of the primary key uh, constraint. Columns often used in where clauses should often be indexed. This is not a, this is a rules of thumb, of course, not, not exactly rules. Foreign keys, if often used in joins, might be indexed. Columns often used in order or group functions might be indexed. Commonly used functions, you can actually index the average of a field. So you can put an index on an aggregate function. To if you're constantly calculating averages, well, in, you can index it or need averages. You can index that average value. Uh, how that happens inside the computer, I'm not quite sure. Spatial columns almost always should be have an index on them. It'll speed things up. But it shouldn't, indexes, for many small databases, indexes make no difference on performance, really, to be honest. Uh, I think only once databases start to get a significant size does it, you really need to implement indexes. So for many small databases, indexes are not required. Does no harm? Well, let's rewind that. It can do some harm. But there are disadvantages. This is the harm that an index can do. Think a big index of a book. OK, so I've got a big book, and I decide how big is my index in the back going to be. The larger I make my index, the more complicated it is to find something in my index. Eventually, I could make an index that is larger than the, book, the size of the book itself, potentially. If I was indexing every word in the book, the index would be larger than the book itself, because you've got the word that potentially could be as large as that. Small indexes. I I, I'm not aware of in being able to index part of a table, but who knows? Well, an index is on a column or on some function of a column, or more, it can be on more than one column. You can index on more than one column if you're using it for, say, a, well, for example, a primary key, a composite primary key would be an index on more than one column, for example. So basically, the, just think the idea is that the bigger the index is, the longer it takes to search through the index to find your result. So therefore, indexes, you can have too complicated an index, which can actually slow things down, actually slow the database down. They also take up quite a bit of space, and space slows things down. So the more indexes you store, the more space, the more searching required. And also, they slow down the inserting, updating, and deleting of data because every time you insert or update data, the index itself has to be updated. So in a transaction environment, maybe you don't want indexing because you want rapid insert and update. But within a query environment, you do want indexing because you want to access the data quickly. Conflicting demands on the system. That's all I'm really saying on indexing. I mean, uh, so there's indexing. Indexing is one way of tuning a query, increasing the, um, the ability of a, the, the efficiency of a query. But there are other things we can do as well. 
Um, there's two commands in, in PostGIS and the equivalent commands in other uh, relational databases called explain and analyze. And what these do is they take a query and give you information about how the query optimizer is executing that query. So this is getting quite detailed under the hood now. It gives you things like the order of searches, how those search rules is it undertaken? Is it using an index or is it doing a sequential search? That's two queries. The planner, you may have defined an index on a field, but the planner may decide to ignore that in index and just do a sequential scan of rows because it thinks that's the best way of doing it, despite the fact that you've defined an index. So things like that. And the times it takes for each action in the sequence to return the results of a query are given. So you can see what part of your query is slowing your query down. And then you maybe you can look at that and see whether you can refactor, rewrite your query because you've got a, a really slow component. It may be that that component of your query is slow simply because it's searching through millions and millions of records and it's just going to be slow no matter what. Or it may be that you can rewrite that part of the query because, as we know, we can write the same query in different ways that might improve performance. So you want some more information up that look up the that 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 web address that will give you some more information on explain and analyze. I've only ever used it about once or twice when I've had problems with slow queries. Then there's the routine maintenance look after your database. Vacuum, I think we've met. That's what's called a, a garbage collect system. It removes deleted records. So remember, every time you update a deleted record in a data in relation to the database, that that record is just sort of flagged as being no longer valid. It's not actually deleted off disk. Vacuuming goes through, finds all these old records that are flagged as old, removes them all, compresses, effectively compresses the database size. Also, the, the query planner, uh, how it plans the queries, it plans the queries on the basis of values stored in a system catalog called PG Statistic. If you do select star from PG statistic, you will get the PG statistic table returned for you. Uh, I had a look at it the other day and couldn't say I understood a great deal in, in it without looking up the, uh, what the field stood for, but you can have a look and see what's there. But what those statistics, to do with how often a query is run, things like that, are used by the query optimizer to plan queries, how to order the sequences in queries. PG statistic is not automatically updated by the database because it takes effort by the system. So periodically the system administrator should use the analyze to update the, the, the PG statistics, uh, the statistics held in PG statistic. As long as the, if they're up to date, then the query planner is planning on the basis of good data, good metadata on the uh, on the uh, tables and how they are used, and it will provide a more efficient result. Often, when you add new data, delete data, you're changing the number of rows and things like that, which is part of the PG statistic table. So if you load any data up or do any significant data edits, it's a very good idea to run vacuum and analyze together to compress the data and then to update the statistics in the PG statistics table. You also, monitoring usage is a good idea, because then you understand how the data is being used, which and allows you to actually optimize to actual use as opposed to perceived use, which may be different things. So you may have gone into your, u your users, developed your database, on the basis of what the users think they need, but in reality the users end up doing something slightly different. So unless you're monitoring how those people are using the data system, how database, you probably you may be optimizing to the wrong thing. All right, now I don't have a have a, a clock visible, so keep me on. So the final section that we're going to look at is distributed databases. So we've been working so far with a simple client-server uh, architecture. You're running Postgres on, in this case, on, if you're running XAMPL 
or a local institution, you're running a local host on the same computer. It's running as a server on the local computer or on your USB drive. And then your clients, PG Admin 3, QGIS, plug into the server. So these are the client programs accessing the database server. And that's what we've been done. But this could easily be on a remote host, another computer somewhere else. So next year we'll be using MySQL on StudentNet. Uh, then we'll be working with a remote host rather than a local host when you update your, or if you install your database onto the uh, web server here at Kingston. So that's the simple architecture you're using. And now we're going to, next, next year, we're going to move into uh, internet-based architectures, other kinds of uh, architectures. So distributed databases are databases where the data is stored at multiple locations. So instead of one server, we're talking about many servers. And we can identify two general types of distributed databases. One's called partitioned databases which allows the data to, to be, um, sorry, partition databases. I find the terminology a bit confusing over this. Partition databases where the data is stored by the owners of the data, so in, the, in their servers, and then it's brought together. Uh, that's one system. The other thing is you can have multiple copies of the same database. Okay. So you can have a distributed database where it's lots of replicates of the same data set, or you can have distributed data sets that draw on different databases that store different data. So an example, well, I'll give you, uh, well, carry on, we've got an example in a minute. So trans and this should all be transparent to the user. The user shouldn't care where the data is stored. Each location is an autonomous database. And for a distributed database system, you not only need a database management system at each site, but you also need additional software that manages the control of the distribution of the data. So here's an example of a partition database, uh, the National Land Property Gazetta. So local authorities in England, Wales, They've got the responsibility for street naming and numbering. Uh, but that, that ongo that's ongoing at a, con uh, at a continual basis. And other people are interested, obviously, in addresses. addresses. The post office is interested in addresses. The land, National Land Property Service is interested in addresses. The Ordnance Survey is clearly interested in addresses because of things like master map building things, building contains. And how addresses are allocated may also depend, I don't know, it's not something I'm not an expert on by any means, things like socioeconomic data, perhaps. So the National Lottery, sorry, the National Lottery, National Land and Property Gazetta is a single interface onto this address-based data that comes from a lot, several different organisations. So it's a single portal onto a, re, uh, onto a set of uh, resources held by multiple organisations. So it includes links to individual local authorities who are defining addresses. They're the people who say, we're going to call this road this, and this is going to be the number of this house. It allows the integration of those that address information with the Royal Mail and its postal address file system. How this integration happens, I must say, I, I, I don't know. Uh, you'd have to go and look at it to, have, to see what they do to actually do with this information. But we've got the postal address system links in there, socioeconomic data from the census, the location of the buildings from master map, things like that, and also the National Land and Property Register. So this is. I understand the database of who owns what land and things like that. So it's just an example of a distributed database, uh, or in this case, a partition database. The National Land and Property Gazetta itself, I suspect, may or may not act, I think it probably doesn't, 
contain actual data from any of these organizations at all. It probably has a, a metadata catalog, common metadata catalog, that knows about all these data sets. But the data itself is stored in all these remote locations. It's distributed across the system. It's brought together by the Property Gazetta portal. To their so so it's a periodic basis. So what is live yeah. is an interesting question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, you get these examples, and but actually understanding the details of what goes on in them, you know, it's quite a bit of effort. And unless you're embedded in it and use it on a daily basis, you don't understand what it is. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so that's a good point. These partition databases. So this is an example of partition, but, but in reality, the reality is that there may be effectively a copy of some of these data sets held by here, which are updated on a nightly basis. But whether the links to say the, you know, how live these links are. Is every 24 hours a live link or not? Is every hour a live link or not? No, none of them are live links, but every link to everything, including live data sensors in the world, involves a delay for data transfer and stuff like that. No. Can Kent not see what a neighbouring authority is doing then? Uh, they can see what they're doing, but they don't have their property. They can, by individual, but they can't um, replicate their property. They just sign up so they can sign up. OK. Uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, it's not something I know, not a system that I know much, anything particularly about. It's the principle, though. You know, I could have put, we could have A, B, C, D here, but it's interesting to see what appears to be a partition base may in fact be something else underneath. And that's quite important because the, the, for, the, for the essay that you've got to write, that's the kind of thing that is really interesting if you can dig this out for your, for your essay. And maybe I'll talk about the um, essay maybe next week uh, before Christmas so that you can have time to think about it over Christmas or the database report or whatever it's called, web interface report. OK, so we've got things about distributed databases. Well, that's, we can classify distribute, these distributed basic types of database in two, two types. One, we can uh, homogenous distributed databases, where all sites use the same database management system. Easy to do, relatively easier to di design and manage, also to incrementally grow. So this is basically clones of the same database system in different locations. When I say clones, of course, it may be the same, maybe several versions of Postgres, and they may have different schemas with different data in them different places, but at least they're this all Postgres, and Postgres talks to itself pretty well. Then we have more heterogeneous systems, heterogeneous systems, where the sites may run different database management systems, and that requires more complexity because you've got to transfer between uh, different hardware operating systems, database products. So we need to be able to translate, have translation software. We need that good translation. So a typical solution is to use some kind of specialist software for, that translates between database formats and the ARC SDE spatial database engine program is Esri's gateway, database gateway software. That is what you need to connect, or that's the, probably the best, cleanest way to connect a Postgres database to ArcGIS. If we ran SDE, we could probably be collecting, connecting directly onto our Postgres database through ArcMap rather than using QGIS. As it is, we can't because we don't run SDE. We have a license for it, but we just have nowhere to run it on and don't, no need to run it, basically. OK, so 12 principles of distribution in general. This applies to all distribution. 
uh, systems. This is like the list of what, it, what the requirements or, or, or of the object-oriented model. Not all systems operate all these objectives, but they're kind of 12 general rules for distributed databases. Some distributed databases uh, meet some of these requirements. But it's a kind of overall ideal wish list. Uh, so we can just run through these really quickly. Geographical autonomy. All data is owned and managed locally. No central site. All sites are equally remote. No one site has governing authority over another node. So they're all semi-independent uh, database systems. Continuous operation sites carry on operating even if some other part of the system has dropped out. And we can add new, new sites. Uh, sites being a database won't affect the, affecting the operation of the overall system. The user, location independence, the user does not need to know about the physical location of the, the databases that comprise the system. They just know access the database in the way they go or, or ask for the data and they get it. They don't need to know the IP address. They don't need to know everything like that. Fragmentation independence. I will explain what fragmentation is in a minute. Users can store logically related information to different physical locations. So basically fragmentation is how you break a database up into parts and spread it across these nodes if you're taking one data set and spreading it across multiple nodes. I must say I find some of these a bit repetitive. Uh, replication independence, the ability to, of a database to create copies of a master database at remote site, just the ability to make copies, replicates. Query processing, um, you know, they can query, the user can query the data in multiple places. Well, you wouldn't have a distributed system if you couldn't do things like this. Transaction management, update and insert and detail to multiple databases from a single query. This is obviously quite an important thing when you're trying to update data or insert data across databases here, there and everywhere. You've got to make sure the entire transaction is com commit successfully committed to all databases or you have to reject the, uh, the, uh, the update. So it may be accepted on one database, but not on the other. What do you do? Do you accept the data that's been accepted and deal with the stuff that hasn't been accepted later? Or do you reject the whole transaction and uh, try and redo it? Hardware independence, basically run on different hardware run on different operating systems, run on different networks. Uh, and the da against database independence, the ability to add and retrieve data from multiple database systems. I find some of those things a bit overlapping, but you know, that's, that's the 12 objectives of distribution. So at every database site, you have to have, the, obviously, a version of the database management system. And that stores and retrieves the data held at a site. You also need a transaction ma manager. And this is what I was saying was quite important for updates and things like that. It decides whether data ed edits should be committed or rolled back, depending on the, say, the status of the distributed transactions. So as I say, if you've got data being submitted to two databases, one rejects, the other accepts, what do you do? Do you reject everything? Do you accept the part that's been accepted and deal, maybe try again with the bit that hasn't been accepted? That's the transaction manager's job. And it has to coordinate that across multiple sites, obviously. And then how the coordination occurs, where well, you have a scheduler program, and that manages the order and timing of transactions within and between databases. So transaction manager does the decisions, the scheduler decides how those decisions are, the timing and ordering of, those, of, the, of the actions required before the decision is made. Design of distributed databases. So the first thing that we need to decide, and this is coming from the context of one database being distributed across multiple sites, more than multiple sites having perhaps their own data integrated in one place. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the, they're sort of similar things. 
So fragmentation is how you divide relations into sub-relations, into smaller parts, which are then spread around your different nodes of your distributed database. Then we've got allocation, which is how those fragments are actually stored across sites. So one is breaking it apart. The other is where those parts are going to be. And the third thing is duplicate replication, which is where you duplicate data across sites rather than breaking things apart and putting them across sites. So fragmentation. So users basically work with views on the distributed database rather than entire relations. So everything is kind of a view because you don't need to know what's behind it. That's behind the view is where the the, all the links to where that distributed data is. So users deal with views rather than data tables. One should, when you fragmate, break apart a database to spread it among different nodes. We uh, should store, how are we doing on time actually? 5-2, oh good, right, okay, efficiency, store it in different places, store it locally, uh, not needed by local app. So don't store any additional data that's not required. Uh, the less data you put across the network, the lower the network load, improved response times. Uh, with fragments as a unit of distribution, transaction can be divided into several sub-queries or parallelism. Basically, we can undertake processing in parallel or multiple machines, which increases our speed potentially. Uh, also, it means that data is not required by local applications, is not stored in local databases, and isn't available to OB users. I think what we'll do is actually stop there because we've run out of time. Uh, I'll try and finish off this section uh, for the first thing next week, and then we can, there's not much to huge amount there. Next week, I thought we'd have an applications based, Christmas y type of thing, tell you about some of my trials and tribulations in life, which I'm sure you want to hear. So I'll talk about two databases that I've been involved in, concentrating on the database side of things. Uh, and as you can say, some of it's been fun and some of it's been not so fun in life. Okay, and we'll finish off, just finish off that, that section next week.